This is the Open Global Mind call for Thursday, October 24th, 2024. So it's 1024 24 or 24 10 24, depending which continent you live on. Um, a friend of mine, Amidar, uh, is the founder of Idealist, and he has a big idea to get people to volunteer together uh, on 1 1 2 2 3 3 4 4 5 mm -hmm. 5, etc. Part of the joke being it works for you wherever you are on the planet. <laughs> Um, we have been on a, I think, a, a very nice round of conversations about emergent forms of coordination. Um, I'm hoping Sam can make today's call. He's been central to these calls. Um, and um, I think it's a, a good idea to dive back in to those areas uh, before going in for uh, a place where, where Gil and I were talking about starting. I just wanted to see if anybody had any thoughts or feedback or um, insights from the conversation thus far. <clears throat> there being no such comments. Um, How rare is that? Hey, pardon? How rare is that? I know, I know. Uh, normally a talkative group. Uh, so Gil, you had a nice idea about uh, a way to frame our conversation that addresses some of the questions we've been having about terminology, etc. So please, uh, Go for it. Yeah, give me a second to get yep. back to the notes here. Whoops, where'd that go? Oh, okay, my notes have vanished. Give me a second here. So right. I, I was really struck in the conversation two weeks ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, oh, I know where it is. Uh, Sorry to be goofy, folks. I, I I woke up and checked my email and discovered I was supposed to be on a call at 6 a.m., which Ooh. I then jumped onto. Um, There's Sam. Golly. And Gil, while you're looking, uh, Robin and I um, have known each other for a long time. It's lovely to have you on the call. Thanks for joining us. Um, Thanks. Nice to be here. I've been, I've been uh, catching up on the messages on the Google group and uh, reading some interesting articles. So uh, it seems like a great engaged community. Thank you. We'd, we'd like to think we are. Um, Gil, have you found the things you need? No, but I'm gonna look somewhere else. Oh, I, I, was, okay. I was looking for our email exchange this morning, which seems to have vanished. Oh no. Yeah, but that's all right. I, I've got it handy, so. I've so, got I've got an email system full of squirrels lately for some reason I don't know why. And um, talk among yourselves. So I'm going to send you in the chat the oh, middle the middle of what you had sent me. There we go. I think. Oh, good. All That's right. Good. If Back to you. Email arrives in an inbox and you can't find it later. Did you ever receive it? <laughs> <laughs> Resembles something about a bear in the woods. Um, yeah. So, so here's the thing. I like to be very simple. So, it struck me in that conversation two weeks ago when we were talking about governance uh, that we were talking about a lot of similar, related, and different things in similar, related, and different ways. And for for me, I was experiencing it as kind of a jumble of mixes of logical types and missing some coherence. And uh, and what I listened was something that made sense to me is to array these elements that I was hearing in a kind of spectrum. I don't want to call it a hierarchy. It's not that at all, but some sort of relationship of these pieces. Um, <clears throat> and we started off talking about governance. We talked about government, which strikes me as a subset of governance. Um, and governance uh, as a subset, maybe of a category that I'd call coordination. Uh, governance is one of the ways to do coordination. We talked a little bit about the um, <clears throat> my pushback on Norbert Wiener uh, of talking about cybernetics as a science of communication and control, and I think it's a science of communication and coordination. So government, governance, coordination, which is a um, an aspect of relationship um, which is grounded in being. So there's a spectrum of five, government, governance, coordination, relationship, and being. And for me, that helped me make sense 
of the conversation that we were having, uh, not wanting to hop randomly between those or think that they're all the same thing, but really discern where we are in the mix at any given time and what are we trying to do. Um, Jerry, you know, when I spoke that two weeks ago, you said this would be a great place to start uh, in a succeeding conversation. So you want to say a little bit more about why you reacted that way? Sure. Um, and we've had, we've come to this topic a few different times in OGM. Um, mm -hmm. We've made some progress and I think some of us are like, all right, all right, where, where do we go? What do we do? And along the way, we've had several conversations about should this should the title of these calls be about governance or uh, self governance or coordination or cooperation or something else? And I think that um, just exploring our frames for the topic would be really useful uh, in that sense. So we can actually kind of uh, unpack this a little bit and figure out what we mean. Um, and uh, let me go to Sam, who I think has something to say about the subject now. Yeah, just I really appreciate that framing. Um, I think it's helpful. And, um, you know, my my motivation in this conversation is that, um, you know, we're reaching planetary boundaries um, at 8 billion people. And um, there's a, from my perspective, it, there's a good chance that we, you know, will go off a carbon cliff and not have the resources to maintain our quality of life, let alone um, perhaps even um, causing, you know, catastrophic, catastrophic crisis. And, and so we, so there's a coordination that has to happen at the level of billions, you know, and, um, and you know, people, and it, it has to be at that level because, you know, people over here can't just keep burning the carbon while these people don't, then these people get a competitive advantage and then they wage war and they take over these people and all of that stuff. So, you know, it's like, there's this, there are these multipolar traps of of like, hey, if one person does it, everybody has to do it. And those are very hard to get around unless we court find ways to coordinate. And that requires a coordination system. And so um, for me, like coordination and governance, there's like, um, <clears throat> the, the difference is that the governance has an enforceability that the coordination doesn't. And I think that's really important. And, um, you know, and government, of course, is like a, an ossified sort of form of governance, I would say, that's how I would think of it anyway. But um, so, you know, so for me, you know, just the preservation of like, you know, humanity and like, you know, our qualities of life and, you know, all those kind of things that are things that I worry about. Like for me, it's like, it's about governance. That's the, that's kind of the track that I'm most interested in coordination and governance sort of, but um, coordination in that we find better ways to do things together, excuse me, um, we that we figure out how to um, find sense make and and find better solutions and and um, and, um, and and but then there also should be this sort of element of like enough trust in the sense making and decision making process that there can be some enforceability like hey we're just not going to burn any more carbon we're going to do this we're going to do that instead we're going to you know um we're going to um manage the amount of nitrogen we put on the soil to minimize um you know the dead zones in the in the ocean and um, that require that here are the guidelines for that and you know this and this these guidelines have been um developed by a bunch of people who really understand and care about not only the farmers and their crops and you know the fact that people need to eat but also the long term sustainability of the soil and the water and the et cetera. And so, you know, having a, a, tr a trustworthy coordination process for developing processes, developing guidelines, and then enough trust or perhaps some enforceability in some way to say, hey, we're just not going to, sorry, we're just not going to destroy things anymore. Sorry, I know it's profitable. It's nice to just take that one little paper cut, no, you know, cutting down that one little tree you know, it seems like it's going to really help you. And it's, 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 it doesn't seem like it's going to do a lot of good, but what happens if everybody does it? So sorry, you can't cut down that tree, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all I have to say. Um, thanks, Sam. I, I just asked in the chat, is governance a specific formalization of coordination? And I like the distinction you're drawing about how in enforceability is one way of talking about it. Because we can coordinate that we're all going to wave to each other when we take the trash out up to the curb on, you know, Thursday mornings or something like that. And that's a form of coordination that has no 
structure to it. It's just an informal uh, agreement. But governance is when you start to say, hey, uh, here are the ways we're going to do that. Um, Doug B. And Doug C. Is, hasn't been on the call for a couple of weeks, but uh, go ahead, Doug. So um, the, the starting premise of enforceability, which sort of has a wrapper around the word force, I think there's this, this habit to take that as a given. Like that just has to be there. There's no conceivable um, viable reality without an element of force exerted over or onto um, another. And I question whether as long as you have that as the foundational assumption um, that anything you build on top of that is going to be different than the paradigm we're currently in. Um, this begs the question, uh, are you suggesting a force-free form of coordination among humans is possible and could work? And it's a, there's, a path you're, there's a path you're pointing to, but not describing yet. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but actually, actually, that was the shortest possible answer. I do actually, appreciate your brevity. Actually, yes. Um, and and unless unless uh, my belief, unless as a species, we can explore doing that piece differently, what orient, is this? orienting differently yeah. to to our response to what is currently a context where we apply force or we uh, or we say no or we punish or we exclude or we send away or we kill um, unless we can explore alternatives to that recourse um, on a fundamental orientational embodied level um, that uh, there's no way to change anything uh, built on top of that being incorporated. As an, as an ingredient. Um, other than pacifism or other kinds of phrases for it, what, what names would this go under and what, what communities on the globe of any size have practiced something like this? Um, well, I think it's certainly modeled in indigenous tribal patterns. Um, and so there are, you know, models and historical antecedent roots. And it's not, pacifism is actually a thing in response to exercise of force. It's context specific. And, and that's not what I'm, I'm not suggesting a political shift in direction. I'm, I'm, I'm going to something more fundamental embodied and, and uh, existential and, and proto, which is, an orientation that says um, we don't do force. We don't project as a species to the, per, to the man, woman, or child, to the individual. We don't have recourse to that as an answer to anything. What are the alternatives? And I don't think it's about, um, I, I don't have a, a card deck or, a, or a, you know, <laughs> an offering to say, here's the replacement for that. It's, it's a, but it is a fundamental, if not that, then how do we do this? And, um, and we're, we're a smart, you know, we're a really smart, clever species. And I believe we could figure that out if, if we're oriented toward um, connection, care, responsibility for each other and for the other living biome that we share the planet with and for the planet itself. We are clever enough that we're practically going to put ourselves out of existence. Um, Pete. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for exploring that, Doug. Um, I, 
I was going to say the same thing. Dave brought it up in, in the chat as well. Um, uh, as soon as Sam said, um, governance has an enforceability, um, you're going to end up in situations from, you know, from where we are today, um, uh, we have negotiated ourselves into a situation where the state uh, has a monopoly on legitimate violence. Um, and, you know, you know, this state can say, hey, that state, you can't cut down those trees. Um, and then they start cutting them down. It's like, no, really, we mean it. You can't cut them down. And it's like, well, we're going to continue to cut them down and burn them. So you, uh, the way it works now is you have to go over there with your armed forces and, you know, stop people, physically stop people. Um, so it's an interesting, I, I think this is, well, in, in one in one sense, it seems like kind of a, a rat ball because it's like, this is a, a big, tough problem. But on the other hand, <laughs> if you can't solve that one, then, you know, it, it's it's hard to draw a line where like enforceability doesn't require ultimately somebody saying, well, we have the force to stop you from doing it, physically stop you from doing it, kill you if you need, if we need to, right? Um, so I don't know how to get out of that. And, and I guess, um, so I didn't see this conversation going into a place where we co contemplated a way to get out of that, but, but in the, the, you know, the few moments of thinking about it, um, just, just the physics of it, I think, um, the only way to get, to get from where we are to where we want to be without so much force in the world or something like that is to be able to project a lot of force and to continue to kind of um, bootstrap that back down, you know, um, uh, we're going to uh, we we could kill you <laughs> uh, if you if you could kill us, but let's ratchet it down, right? Um, I I think it's also it's uh, mind-boggling uh, to me to be having this conversation in the United States of 2024. <clears throat> um, especially after I, the, the way I see the, the history of the world kind of um, uh, World War II happened, the United States didn't really want to get involved, but ended up getting involved. And, and in a way, kind of an, an industrial might won the war, right? And we turned ourselves into a, 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 a military industrial machine that said, well, we've decided to have a monopoly over you know, a, a lot of the violence, not all of it. You can't, you know, we've, we've had people say, well, I've got a nuclear bomb too. Um, but the U.S. has continued to maintain that uh, primacy of state violence, you know, the threat of state violence. So we're all living in this kind of like peaceful place where we can have debates about governance and things like that, largely because or largely influenced by um, our country's willingness to, to spend uh, an insane amount of money on making sure that we can blow anybody up in anywhere in the world that we want to. So it's, it's a mind boggling uh, ir irony to me. Ironic indeed. Um, Alistair. Yeah, uh, and I, uh, I can't hear you. Yeah, your voice is really low. You're not, uh, I don't know what microphone is. Oh, there. can you hear me better now? The boom yeah. was up. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. You've lowered uh, the boom on us, and it's much better. Yes. Um, yeah, so what Pete uh, said just now, it certainly resonates with me. Uh, I put my hand up because I uh, saw the uh, comment in chat which said uh, that uh, uh, very early on, uh, that uh, our this problem sort of forces us to, uh, to coordinate or something like that. And there's something about that language that... Uh, uh, I know that when I saw that when I was much younger, I would hear people talk about some problem and they say, we must uh, find a solution to this, or this forces us to find a solution. And I would breathe, breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, good. I don't have to worry about this because there is going to be a solution because we're forced to find one. But actually, I mean, what people mean really when they say we must find a solution is we really want to find a solution, but if we don't, then, well, people just keep on suffering consequences, you know. There isn't really something, some external uh, entity that forces us really to find a solution, even when it's in our best interest. And of course, that's uh, a, tra a tragedy, but uh, that's how I see things. So I just wanted, I just wanted to put that out there. 
Thanks. Thank, thanks, Alistair. Uh, the queue has flipped around on me somehow. Uh, Stacy, were you in there and dropped out, or it came down by itself? Okay. Um, oh, good. I, why don't you go ahead and then uh, I'll head back to the queue. Okay. I don't think I was next, but I'll be really quick, <laughs> so I'll go anyway. Um, I just wanted to say, um, from an emotional, energetic point of view, I think that just pivoting towards the coordination is actually a positive thing because as we as we're coordinating and we're creating you know people that create their own rules follow their own rules and they're not even rules you know we need lines on the road like the idea that we would have no lines on the road to drive on would not be a good thing so if we were anyway that's all i want to say <laughs> just just shifting to coordination i think is a good start <laughs> And you're pointing to the lines on the road is really interesting because um, traffic calming is one of my favorite examples of coordination without requiring a lot of affordances that we think of as, as bringing safety. Uh, and what traffic calming requires is the design of streets and intersections in a way that causes people to slow down a little bit because it looks a little bit dangerous, actually. And then for people to pace match through intersections, for example, so that everybody isn't sitting waiting like burning burning fuel sitting waiting when nobody's going the other direction that doesn't happen in a traffic calmed setting uh because but you're relying on coordination Jerry, though, Please. since you brought that up if i could just share how much outrage there is in a certain local group over the arrows that they put in supermarkets telling you how to walk i mean <laughs> so again <co> <laughs> it would be better to if we start with coordination i think it's a good start <laughs> uh thanks sam yeah so <clears throat> yeah there's a lot a lot to talk about here but and certainly like my preference will will always be to you know i think it's a it's a moral imperative that you know like we minimize enforcement in general down to zero if possible like that's that's like a that's a good principle right but i don't know i'm a i'm a doctor like and i've worked with people with personality disorders and you know i've i've also you know been bullied in my life and as a kid and you know like we we make agreements with each other right but really we should call them disagreements because it's really about what happens when we disagree and i think it's very high minded to say hmm you know what we're never going to disagree we're just going to you know we're going to be able to coordinate our way through all of these things and i just beg to differ. I just don't. I, I think there's a little bit of a naivete about what we are as a species. We're a bunch of um, we're a bunch of predatory monkeys. And let's be honest about that. And, you know, if it suits my my benefit to to cut down that tree, you know, or, you know, take this or do that, you know, I think we have a historical precedent to say that without a very strong coordination system, that you know like the Janes or the you know there, there there have been societies that have done it you know the Janes don't won't hurt harm an insect you know and they're vegetarian like we know that it's within our capacity as human beings to do this and i you know and so but we also know that it's in our capacity to have the war ch war children of darfur who don't get past the age of six before they've killed somebody you know, and mutilated and raped and all the other things that they do, that's within our capacity too. So I think we need to be very realistic about, you know, how coordination needs to happen. Like, you know, sure, we can say, yeah, let's, you know, just flowers and rainbows and let, let's, you know, I'm uh, I'm a hippie kid. I, I believe in flowers and rainbows, but we also just have to be very clear that, you know, when someone's got money to make, you know, and they're, they're going to, they might take that shortcut. They might cut that tree. They might, you know, hit that person in the head or whatever it is. I mean, if anybody's worked with kids, it doesn't matter how perfect you create that environment. They're going to hit each other sometimes. Sorry, that's how it goes. We're we're primates, you know. Primates don't have a good track record. So um, that's my opinion. And it'd be great to create the society that does that. But what's more important to me about this conversation, I, I really don't want to go too far into force what i do want to go into is the coordination exactly um as stacy would have said and so for me develop, creating a system of coordination is really what's exciting for me and um 
and so um the you know the thing that I'm, I'm that I'm really talking about here you know while while it skirts on the edges of enforceability like we consider ways that this governance system that I'm proposing could infiltrate existing government and thereby sort of um, crowdsource and um, um, create a um, a better coordination system within the governments that we have. And but it would also sort of take on the enforceability of government. So we could say, hey, you know, you can't cut down the tree in the park. That's just how it goes. Oh, and you can't hit somebody on the head and et cetera. So um, so but but to allow the coordination to extend into a, a larger arena where it's like, OK, you can't burn fossil fuels anymore. Sorry, there's not much left, but we got to leave them in the ground. And what does that mean? It means that we have to do this and we have to do that. And we have to do that. That's all enforceability because somebody. The, the pro thing is, fossil fuels have the highest energy den density of any fuel and they're You'll never find a fuel that's cheaper to produce. There's no cheaper source of energy because you got to manufacture the thing that collects it or whatever. You, here, you basically suck it out of the ground. We have all the we have all the infrastructure. So it's it's super it's super um, like enticing. It's super um, profitable. It's super like it's it's like candy. And there's people that just want that yacht and they just want that third home and they just want that whatever it is. And they're gonna dig and pull that stuff out, out of the ground unless we really find a way to coordinate around that you know so that's my two cents um sam those are a, a lot of actually sort of strong opinions that i think are causing interesting reactions in the group um our founding our founding beliefs drive policy a lot a lot is what we think people are and how we how we expect them to behave what we assume is natural behavior, whatever natural means, drives policy. Uh, it drives a whole bunch of other things. So for example, one of my favorite dichotomies here is, are people born evil or born good? So original sin means humans have fallen from grace. We are all evil and must be, must be perfected in order to make it back into heaven somehow. That sets up a whole series of procedures and hurdles and expectations and power relationships. OMG, that is powerful shit. To believe and um you know the matthew fox got famous for writing a book called original blessing which he says it's a little it's different from that and which was interesting to me because that framing was is so influential across the globe right and that that framing doesn't need to exist it's a it's a i think it's a construct uh that you know that, that if humans are born evil and i actually believe the opposite i think humans are born into the world pretty connected to everything and we managed to socialize that out of them. But that's my amateur version of sociology and, and you know, how, how humans sort of work together. And I think we all have our stories and experiences and mental models of how this works. And I'm glad that we're busy comparing them here because we need to compare notes. We need to sort of say, hey, here, here's what I ended up believing and here's, and here's why maybe, uh, which is, I think, a very fruitful conversation to have uh, for us to have here. So thank you for putting those things on the table. Uh, Gil. Hunting for the mute button. There you go. Hunting for the mute button. <laughs> um, I'm really struck by all the assumptions rippling through this conversation. Uh, uh, the assumptions of the necessity of force. Uh, I'm, I'm with Doug, right, Bart, on that conversation. You know, we, we come to it with an assumption. Um, the assumption that we are just predatory monkeys. Anytime somebody says we are just dot, 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 I get itchy because we're far more complex than that. Um, and um, the, you know, for me, one of the richer proof texts for this these days is, is, um, is um, um, uh, the dawn of everything, which uh, in addition to laying out the enormous variety of human experience over the span that we have any evidence of, um, posits that dilemma, you know, the original sin dilemma of are we, you know, are we um, gentle creatures who've gone awry or predatory creatures who are kept in check? The, the, um, the, um, uh, what is it, the Hobbes versus Voltaire argument? And we have examples in human experience of all of those, both of those in various kinds of mixes. Um, 
you know, um, Sam's talking about, it's, it's funny, Sam, you talk about the ideal of having no force, but the, a, a strong inclination to force, to impose an eco-goodness on the rest of the world. Um, but of course, who's going to do that? You know, how do you find the right kind of person to be the authoritarian chief of everything um, to, to drive that? So the it, we're, we're filled with ironies. And I, and I asked in the chat, I, I know... I, I know that a bunch of people on this call are in long-term personal relationships, you know, living for another person in a building, in a, in a household for a long period of time. Where is their force in those relationships? You know, and there certainly are marriages that have force in them, but there, I, I suspect most of the ones here don't. And so what's the, there's, a, there's this, again, a spectrum from that experience of two people living together in a relationship without force to a global directorate imposing right solutions and everybody on an 8 billion person planet. There's a lot of stuff in between there. And I think that's our challenge. Um, last thing I'll say, um, um, I spent a bunch of time last week with a guy named Neil Tease. He's an MD, uh, pathologist, pioneer of stem cell work um, and, and something called the, the, the interstitium, which is a topic we should return to at another time. Um, and uh, he's just come out with a book called Notes on Complexity. Uh, and I just posted uh, just posted a video of a conversation we had um, last night. And Neil is looking deeply at, um, at the nature of complex adaptive systems and how they self-organize. Uh, and, um, you know, just to take the simplest example, this thing here has no, has no command and control. There is no central directorate running this thing. Yet somehow it works, not just in my individual lifespan, but over the lifespan of life on this planet as a self-organizing process without command and control. So how does that happen? And what can we learn from that? And how do we start to apply that into the conversation that we're having here? Thanks, Gil. Dave? Uh, sorry, I thought I was expecting Doug. Um, I so I've been trying to address this problem from the notion of uh, how do we do large scale cooperation or coordination, and I think so. My orientation is towards uh, some notion of improving assets or creating value in the world or something, and I, I think there might be an opposite, which is you know protecting things or you know stopping damage or you know there may be kind of two sides to government in some sense. Um, and and I think, you know, I think we're maybe just starting the last few decades to really explore some, I don't know, maybe I don't know the history well enough, but but I, I think we've got a few examples of large scale cooperation that aren't heavily reliant on the ability to use force. Um, and, you know, the, my favorite one is still kind of the internet notion of rough consensus and running code, right? I mean, that that leads to a lot of coordination, which has led to a lot of creation of assets that I think are valuable uh, without much violence that I know of. And, and what's implied, I think, in that case is there is a magic thing, which is the it works, right? People, it works and people use it. It's kind of that combination. And so if you're trying to get something done and you can demonstrate it works and other people say, well, that works, I'm going to use it. You have coordination, you know, and, you know, Bob's your uncle, you're great. Um, but I don't think it's the only examples we're seeing. I mean, I think the, I think the Jane Jacobs economics, uh, you know, kind of has led, you know, her notion of the neighborhood and neighborhood coordination uh, is another form where we have, a lot of kind of consensus around behavior and kind of uh, an implicit vote, if you will. People have an expectation that's enforced without much violence. And that comes from some level of human connectivity and lots of eyes on the, on the street, right? I mean, it's, it's not like I have to know you, we don't have to be friends, but I know that you're in my neighborhood and I recognize you and there's certain some level of awareness, right? So, you know, we you, you have a whole neighborhood watching out to see that the little eight-year-old on the street is safe. And if there's some like, you know, dirty old guy looking, talking to the eight-year-old, the neighborhood is watching, right? And, and that leads to an outcome which is more safe. Um, actually, and again, I'm going to try to slowly make my way through seeing like a state, which I think is a great 
a great examination of a whole bunch of these issues. And he compares Le, Le, Corbus, Le Corbusier's, you know, urban planning models against Jay Jacobs's planning models as an example. And, and the French model was, you know, like huge, massive, empty uh, squares, efficiency focused, you know, removing people from the equation kind of things, sterile, you know, uh, kind of engineering models, whereas the Jay Jacobs ones are much more organic. Uh, and then I guess the third example, I think, is probably Eleanor Ostrom and the, the management of the commons things, and where, again, I think a lot of the insight is around the uh, enforcement, if you will, is located very close to the issue, where we've taken a lot of our enforcement and we've moved it farther and farther away um, from the actual activity in, in the commons management thing you want, you want the you know, monitoring and the enforcement piece to be right there where the activity is happening. So, you know, this notion that in in the uh, Indonesian um, watersheds where there was trying, where they were sharing water, it was the farmers at the bottom of the watershed who tended to manage the coordination because if they didn't get the water, they knew about it, you know, so they would kind of manage up, up, the, up the hill kind of. Um, so I, I do think we have a number of mechanisms, but they're, I would call them technologies. I mean, I think we have technologies of governance that fit into different appropriate situations. And we've learned a lot over the last couple of decades, but we need to learn a whole bunch more. And, you know, I'd vote for like hearing from Kevin very soon about like what it looks like government, governance and disaster kind of, because I think he's got a real interesting case study going on in real time right now. So. Thanks, Dave. I'm, I'm, generalizing our question a little bit how do we get people to do things together to minimize friction and maximize benefit and sometimes there are situations where there's a lot of innate friction uh, like this is my territory no this is my territory would be one of the big ones but there's a, plenty of them and and one of the questions is how do you not necessarily solve those problems but how do you dissolve those problems how do you um, in my management 101 class at Wharton Business School, we did the ugly oranges case. <clears throat> Anybody have the ugly oranges case, U-G-L-I? So the, divide the class in two, give uh, both sides the case to read. You have a million dollars and there is a ship coming into port that carries the only uh, load of ugly oranges on the planet. Uh, you need the, the juice from the oranges because you are going to make a cancer curing serum out of only the ugly oranges contain the right, you know, chemicals to do that. So go negotiate with the other side. And uh, I'm going to like steal the punchline. So if you ever have this case, uh, you, it, I will have ruined it for you. But the answer is one team needs the juice. The other team needs the, the peel. And they can buy the shipment for a buck and spend $999,000 on their research, right? The negotiation is to figure out that there isn't a problem. They're bo they both don't need the same exact thing but they need to get to the place where they're having that conversation. And I think a huge number of world problems are like that, that uh, mix in then people's thirst for power, need for power, and a whole series of artificial constructs that get built up to impose power, uh, which is sometimes what we call civilization. Uh, and, and that gets really messy because all of those things are very hard to hit undo on. We've poured them in concrete. And a lot of us are busy like suffering through what that means, the implications of those, those kinds of things. And then those, those kinds of things, when you pour them in concrete, get gamed, get bought, get uh, controlled uh, by people who are really powerful. And that's the situation we're sort of suffering in now. Um, I put in the chat that Kalia and uh, Dave Waterbury are writing a, a piece about the IETF, about how the IETF works and why it seems to work so well. Uh, it has some gentle and interesting patterns and means of uh, coming to decisions and, and so forth. So uh, I don't think it's done, but they shared a draft on Google Docs uh, that people can look at if they want, uh, which I, uh, Pete, do you think it's okay if we share the link to the draft here? I think it's in, in read-only mode, right? Yeah, I think cool. it's okay. Uh, I, will, I will share that link. And my one concern about their piece, Jerry, just to stick this in, is that... Yeah. They kind of talk about the IETF being really cool today, and I think it probably is, and it's got some cool tools and stuff like that. The internet grew before that existed, right? So it, it, if you were to say, I want to build another internet, and I were to answer, create the IETF, I think that would be wrong, because the IETF has been a result of some of this stuff, not the cause. And so I think we have to go back farther in history 
to, you know, like RFP one was written to, you know, the internet working group, which didn't exist. And so there, there were some, there's, there was a different thing happening that led to a whole bunch of the infrastructure. And then the IETF has evolved out of that, but not, it wasn't causal. So anyway. Um, thanks, Dave. Doug. Yeah, so I wanted to sort of loop back around to um, address this idea that somehow where I left off was, you know, suggesting a naive reality that's free of conflict and, and triggers and tickles and all of that. Um, what I've, this is sort of an interesting piece of the puzzle I picked up along the way. We love creating polarities for ourselves and polarities are hugely constrictive. And there's no way to access the n variables of possibilities in any situation or context, as long as the boundaries are, are defined in a polarity. So I, want, I just wanna pick one piece of the puzzle from my own personal experience that by stepping out of it, and it's absolutely considered a foundational given today's world, that is the transactional exchange of value. Seven years ago, I made a decision. I said, you know, when I serve other people and, and contribute, um, I really love doing it. And the minute I have to do that transactionally, I hate doing it. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna stop doing that transaction. And the common, general common response is, you know, can't do that, you'll, you'll starve. And I said, well, if I'm providing my value, not in a, unconditionally, if somebody asks and I provide, that doesn't mean I don't have needs. It doesn't mean I don't need money to flow to me. I don't have to pay rent. I don't have to buy food. I don't have to do all that stuff. But by stepping out of the transactional frame, which is fundamentally a polarity, it put needs in its own box. I have them. Am I clear about what they are? Um, and I need to meet them. And what are the pieces and dimensions of doing that? And I started to unpack and put pieces in place to say, well, I need a means for people to flow value to me. Like I, that's on me to set up ways and places for people to give me money. And, and it took seven years, um, not buying any Learjets anytime soon, but survived. And seven years of experimentation and, and, and fiddling around to arrive at a, a one and a half page document. So somebody says, yeah, could you help me? And I go, sure. And they go, well, how could I reciprocate? And I go, well, I'll send you something. And I send this one and a half page thing out, which says um, out of gratitude, you know, you asked, here are the ways you can send money, you can send things, you could buy books off my wish list and Amazon, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. And, you know, here are an array of things people have done in the past in this regard in connection with the different things that I provide to people to give you a guideline if you feel you need that. But if you don't, sky's the limit, give as much as you'd like because I appreciate it. <laughs> and you know what? It works. Holy shit. You mean you can actually operate in an appreciation economy, non-transactionally? Holy shit. So I wanna pick one piece. I, know, I, I don't wanna to run too long, but I do wanna pick one piece out of Sam, out of, your, out of your mentioning of things, fossil fuels. So, 
addressing fossil fuels, not through a, pola polar, a polarity lens of it's the cheapest, densest, and uh, human nature is, you know, you go to the cheapest, densest, cheapest, fastest, you know, most profitable. Well, there's another lens which says, well, you know, all the people vested and staked in the fossil fuel vertical, they know their day is coming. They're profiteering of the moment, but don't think they're not sitting there going, what the fuck are we going to do when uh, the balance tilts toward, you know, other forms of energy? We're, we're obsoleted. And they do have a profit-driven incentive to stay in the profit game. And that's a very strong and powerful driver and motivation. And if instead of looking at them in the box of the bad guys and the profiteers and look at them as the in the best position to innovate and to repurpose and to adapt and modify their infrastructure and all the moving parts of their business, to other purposes and uses in service to good that would also be profitable for them, they'll go there. You just have to make that business case. For them, you have to speak to what drives them. They'll do good in service as long as they're making profit. They'll let go of pulling it out of the ground and extracting it as long as they know their refineries and their distribution channels are still putting something through them in service to generating money for them. And the emergence of hydrogen and the emergence of all sorts of other things that could leverage their infrastructure and their distribution networks and all that stuff is there. But like, if, if you're in a polarity, then there's no way to reach to and stretch to how to please them and please the world. Like how to transform that. All stakeholders on board and pulling in the same direction. And I think that's just a matter of, we have the creativity, intelligence, imagination, and technology to figure out those transformations. And I'm done. I'm sorry, I apologize for the length. Doug, there is general public acclaim for you to point to any places where you've described this in writing um, or in videos or whatever on the web. So um I I have been seeing it. I haven't been, you know, working at publishing and being visible with it, but that's starting in 2025. So it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> there's, I'm willing, there's a lot <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to bet you could find a couple people in the room who would listen to you on a recorded zoom uh so that you could just post that and start from there that would be a, a good uh, that would be a good use of time for everybody involved i think thank you pete um thanks um I, I really appreciate the work that uh, Day and Clee are doing uh, to kind of mine the IETF stuff. Um, and it, I had a quick story. My IETF involvement, RFC involvement, was uh, from like 92 to 96 or so. Um, so beginning of the internet is like 1969 or something like that. Um, by 1977, there was this uh, well-formed uh, publication process, the Re Request for Comments series, where um, uh, the name is even interesting because uh, these became standards, uh, but they were always requests for comments. They weren't like, hey, this is the law. <laughs> it's more like, hey, I've got this great idea and I, I kind of want to hear what other people think about it. And over uh, the course of a year or two, each of these RFCs, the good ones would turn into standards, de facto standards. Um, the bad ones would fall by the side and you know you could refer to them and stuff. Uh, one of the important people in that whole mix uh, was the RFC editor, uh, he was called. He was called like a, a couple things, but it was John Postel. Um, and there is some incredibly important he, he was like the axle around which the whole thing turned and if he hadn't been there i'm not sure the whole thing would have turned properly so i, I think a thing to do is to figure out if that's a, a critical um 
function and how you work it. Uh, the, the story I wanted to tell though was by 1990, 1996 or something like that. Um, uh, speaking of uh, nasty primates or whatever, uh, the big one, the biggest networking company at the time was Cisco, um, not the restaurant firm, but the the router company. Um, they had figured out how to game the the system, so they would actually have a couple working teams inside their company that would act like the open source people who came to the, the meetings and were really nice about uh, collaborating and stuff like that. But slowly and in a coordinated fashion, what they would do is they would warp the uh, the standards process, which was all open source. They would warp it into something that was uh, that felt that that fed their sales machine. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm not calling Cisco bad folks or anything like that. But the uh, the the arc of justice that uh, capitalism likes to bend is bent pretty strongly. <laughs> And uh, not even the, the mighty IETF, which was a very collaborative and very cool kind of thing. It was not immune to it. Um, and the way it happened was uh, very stealthily. And I think probably even a, a number of the Cisco engineers who were subverting the system essentially did, weren't aware of what they were actually doing. But if you pull back, you can see that you know, Cisco was a 900 pound gorilla that was taking over the standards process. It was interesting and sad. Um, so we talked about a couple different levels of things. I, I think uh, one of the things I'm, I'm really excited about was when Sam said, hey, you know, if we had the, a little bit of, if we had a governance mechanism that we could slipstream into existing governments and it made things work better, um, you know, the, the world would be a better place. And I think um, we're talking about, uh, so I think uh, we're not talking about uh, well, we are talking about state-to-state -state violence. You know, uh, China and the U.S. have this disagreement about something, and they're willing to go to nuclear war over it. Um, all the way down to Gill's example of two people living together for forty or fifty years, and you know, um, not forcing each other to do that. They're together out of love, right? In between there, there's all the things that we've been talking about: coordination, collaboration, um, you know, coercion. Um, I, so the, the, the whole problem set that we've got here is this pretty tall hierarchy of things. And when it gets down to, uh, the smaller parts of, you know, coordination or something like that, we're talking about coordinating probably billions of entities, right? Um, billions of teams, small teams, bigger teams, um, uh, and probably some of those coordinations happen across, uh, levels, you know, some of them you're, coordinating a team effort, uh, but that's influencing uh, governance, uh, you know, in a, in a county or something like that. Um, uh, so, so I guess one of the cautions for me is to make sure that we're, hey, let's talk productively, uh, let's kind of pick the level we're talking at, and let's pro talk productively there, while also recognizing that the level that we're talking at is massively influenced by uh, bigger and smaller um, uh, forces, uh, collaboration spheres. Um, and then the other thing, I think the only way this happens in finite time um, before we decide to cook the planet, um, the only way it happens in finite time is to kind of do what Sam said. There are going to be big things that you need to trim tab um, and you can't, you know, it's, it's going to be a long time or a cold day on hell or something like that before the US and China decide to step down from their military spending and uh, have a kumbaya event, right? So the way that's going to happen is a bunch of slipstreamed and trim tabbed kinds of things that change the whole dynamic um, in a massive, uh, you know, massive hierarchical stack kind of. Um, so um, it's not a small problem. And I think it's useful for us to remember that um, it's cogs within cogs within cogs or something like that. And you kind of have to be aware of um, a, a few levels up and a few levels down from where you are, um, even when you're talking about how important this particular thing is. And this is the main thing that you want to work on. So thanks. Thanks, Pete. Sam. Yeah, Pete, I re really appreciate that. I, I think, um, you know, part of my, my, um, you know, I don't know how you want to call it, my aggravation, agro-ness or my realism or whatever it is, comes from 
um, the fact that, you know, my parents were, were hippies and the hippie generation I watched very carefully as they tried to influence and change the world. And they did indeed influence change the world. In fact, we could say that they won in a lot of ways. I mean, we all just wear blue jeans and blah, 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 whatever. You know, organic food is in every grocery store. But that hasn't stopped you know, the military spending. That hasn't stopped the pollution. That hasn't stopped the, you know, the accumulation of more and more toxic chemicals in our environment. Cancer causing, you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, nice, Robin. Um, and so um, I think, you know... <clears throat> Even like um, Doug's statement about, well, it's, 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 you know, I think even Doug is ca causing a false dichotomy here, which is that we're not, you know, we are both, you know, um, the, the peaceful, you know, the peaceful creatures and the dangerous creatures, you know, we're, we're both, we're always like, even a mother and its child are competing and they're having a transactional relationship on one level at the most, that the most you know, <clears throat> holistic and, and, um, you know, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for the most like uh, intimate kind of relationship you can even imagine. There's a, there's a sort of a competition there. And then, you know, so we have to, we have to be realistic, like sure we're this, but we're also that. And that's why we have agreements because we know we might disagree and that's what agreements are about. It's about when we disagree. And so, um, and so that, that holism of taking, taking a step back and saying, well, you know, I, it's fine. I, I can not have transactional relationships with anybody. Maybe you can, but I don't see that. I, 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 I think you're disguising it. Actually, I think you are, and you're just not admitting it to yourself. That's me. You know, that's my um, judgy, judgy self coming out. But um, you know, and I think that's okay. Like it's okay for us to be transactional with each other at times because it's sort of part of the way things happen. Um, even just on a biochemical level, you know, the competition for electrons and the blah, blah, blah. You know, you can look at anything through any lens you want. So, um, and it's valid. It's all has a grounding in reality. And so, you know, I just want to be careful. I'm always very careful when I try to say it's this and not that. Um, and so, um, but, uh, you know, but, but I, but to, to, to more to what Pete was saying is like, what I'm interested in focusing on indeed is like, you know, let's get away from this governance thing and let's focus on the coordination thing. And let's say, um, like, how can we maximize our coordination? How can we maximize our sense-making ability? Um, how can we um, follow the principles of good governance to um, create a more inclusive and um um, um, let's say holistic um, system of coordination. And that's really, you know, that's, that's the nut I'm trying to crack. And, you know, we, we might have different opinions um, about, you know, where it might, it might, you might need this, or you might need that. It might go there. It might, it might not, et cetera. You know, maybe we can do it this way, et cetera. Yeah, sure. But we can have different sort of opinions, but let's, let's indeed, let's go for the, let's go for the, the ideal, which is like a coordination system you know, that works at the level of billions. Um, that's the only, uh, the only choice we have, because indeed, like, you know, unless, um, you know, there, there are so many situations where it just benefits one group of people to do this, and it harms everybody else, these multipolar traps. And so, you know, I think if, if we can find a way to coordinate to say, okay, let's all stop doing that. Let's all, um, you know, reduce the uh, amount of uh, nitrogen fertilizer that we're using and let's all increase the amount of um, and and maybe like the like you guys are um um you know you guys are sort of uh intimating here is maybe the the wisdom of the market will just do it you know maybe just the the price of you know sustainables will will make fossil fuels um you know extinct you know maybe or maybe not you know and and maybe um, you know, as long as there's, it's, it's like a cheaper and easier and faster to just, you know, punch a, pump a bunch of chemicals onto the soil and create some, you know, create some things that look like vegetables, you know, and can sell beautifully in the market, you know, maybe somebody is going to do that, you know? So, um, and so anyway, I think if we have ways of coordinating to say, look, these are best practices, these are ways that we can solve these problems. How can we solve these problems? And doing it in a way, like you all say that, doesn't require force that, you know, can be, um, 
self-evident to the people who are engaged in it that has a broad enough basis of of input that the really the good ideas will come up and and problems can be solved sense making can happen and problems can be solved that's the system that we need to build um and you know like i said I, i'm sort of that's the nut i'm trying to crack and i've proposed um you know a, a system for doing that that involves liquid democracy and a specific form of it we're sort of inventing what that means and so um there's a million different forms of it but um that's the thing that makes sense to me where you can delegate um um delegate um along lines of expertise and you can um, concentrate expertise onto the problems that we solve and yet everybody still has the freedom to engage in those problems and act with their values and delegate with their values and change delegation as soon as somebody's values change and those types of things um you know i just um looking for a, a part of why i'm on this call is i'm looking for a better solution than that i mean that's the best one i can come up with can you help me can you come up with a better one help me out here um and you know like i said i've just spent the last two years and you know hundred thousand dollars or something trying to you know in, um, innovate on this thing and looking for better ways to do it and like i said i know no sunk cost fallacy here i'll drop it in a second as soon as anybody can tell me a better way because it's it's the thing that i feel is the most important for us to accomplish in our lifetimes how are we gonna work together on the planet how are we gonna do that you know let's figure it out if we don't figure it out we're gonna die okay we're all die. that's how i see it maybe there'll be some scattered tribes here and there after the fall of the uh the supply chain and uh you know the, the when the fossil fuels collapse and we don't come up with another solution or you know i don't know there's lots of scenarios but it's looking a little scary to me and so and i feel that um if we don't if we don't solve that you know not just conjecturally like hey you know what um we just you know we have to we have to you know let's let's come up with a concrete solution well i'm coming up with one so you know i'm happy to engage i'm you know i've i've met with several people on this group to who've like engaged with me on it and and really like called into question some of my assumptions and you know made suggestions and i really appreciated that and you know i um open to that anybody just <laughs> come and give me shit i'm happy to take it you know because i don't want to waste time i don't want to have bad ideas and spend all my money doing stupid shit who wants that prove me wrong come up with something better please you know <laughs> engage with me on it and i'll you know, I'll do it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to solve the problem. That's it. You know, anyway. Sam, Sam, where publicly in the intertubes are you putting these things where someone could engage with you publicly in that way, just as a, in a form of sort of debate, sharing information, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, that's a great question. Gosh, that's, my um, job. that's a really good idea. Wow. Um, you know, I had an idea to set up a polis, um, instance where we could start to have a discussion on governance so the governance tool on governance i thought that was fun um that might be a fun way to sort of nonviolently and creatively engage in what does this next governance system look like or what what you know what is it what are the design constraints that we need to consider um what's it going to look like and how can we do it and all that um so that's one thing maybe i'll just do that it doesn't take much to do that and i'll drop the link in the group but um but, you know, if, if anybody wants to like, um, I, I don't know, I don't know. Can you guys help me figure out how to do that? I don't know how to engage those conversations. That's what I'm here for, because a bunch of people like to talk. Let's talk. And you care about governance. Like, I care about governance. Let's talk. You know, that's why I'm here. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping for a more, more of a concrete conversation than a theoretical conversation. I know sometimes it has to start theoretical and move towards concrete. But, I'm, you know, I'm a little itchy, honestly, to get into more concrete. And so if anybody wants to like debate me, like, please, like, let's do it. I'll, I'm happy. I'm not in a mean, you know, mean hearted way. I mean, like in a, like mm -hmm. a earnest sense making, like, let's come up with solutions and let's record it and we'll post it on socials and whatever. Like, please, let's do that. You know, that sounds great. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Just, the... just reach out to me. Let's do it. I'm happy to do it. Thanks, Sam. One of the things you made me think about and several points in this conversation have made me think about is uh, they reminded me of a, a, a trope that I've got that scale kills 
<clears throat> and what I mean here is not what I'm going to sort of say the conclusion I'm going to go toward, but uh, when I say scale kills, what I, I, what I normally mean is the three words I've heard kill more good ideas are it won't scale. <clears throat> and that's because a lot of the things that really actually work in the world are informal, casual, borrowed, flexible, dynamic, interpersonal agreements, norms, whatever, whatever, whatever. And nobody can envision these being replicated exactly in an engineering frame of mind. Like, no, you can't make everybody do that. They're, they're, they're negotiated. They're, they're contextual. They're, in fact, often held together by the fact that these people have to keep living together in some space, right? And even human mobility has increased so much that we're not tied to space. We're not, we don't know our neighbors. All that kind of stuff factors in here. But the piece of scale kills that I wanted to bring in here was that a lot of the things that work, let's say IETF, and let's say that it works reasonably well, uh, suffer then from uh, visibility and importance. So when they're born, everybody's like, yeah, it's a bunch of geek researchers with really long beards uh, who are working on military stuff, and who cares? And uh, they proceed. So, so at the moment when the world's telecom companies are building the advanced intelligent network and are going to take over the world, there's a bunch of geeky engineers who are figuring out how to do protocols that will avoid nuclear war, but that are also equitable and distributed in a way that's nonsense to telecom people. And guess who won? Right? It's, it, the, 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 the internet protocols ate the world's communication networks and did so remarkably well. And at every turn, um, we talked about Cisco. Pete described how Cisco was was sort of trying to turn uh, IETF process toward you know to benefit itself. At every turn, the major vendors and stakeholders have tried to take this thing down, and try, and and so, in its increased visibility and unfortunate centrality, uh, it's attracted a whole bunch of pressure, tension, uh, dysfunction, etc. And the fact that it survives those things to this day is is a bit of a, a bit of a miracle, um, and. So this is one of the downsides of popularity or of success. It's uh, uh, but it doesn't need to be because if we're busy borrowing, appropriating, and customizing, adapting things for our context, and being explicit about that, and if we can kind of point to what we borrowed, which is one of the reasons I like the idea of open source instructions <clears throat> for how to do different kinds of things, just being available and the telling of a lot of stories about how things work and how people did stuff, just being available. And then people who did those things and have some experience also being available, but only on request. Nobody going out there and saying, you must do this, this is gonna work because we've proved it through a scientific study and the average of all the best practices is this thing over here, so you must do this. That doesn't work, right? So how do we leave these best things at hand. And part of what I'm hoping through these conversations is that we have a big toolkit, a big bag of tricks of the best practices and how they work, but also a description of this process of appropriation, adaptation, <clears throat> and customization. Because only when a group of people has made something their own, are they really vested in it and interested in it and interested in keeping it going. They, they, they buy in. I think we talked about buy in a couple so calls ago. I hate the term buy in. Buy in is basically somebody else came up with a really good idea. They're trying to sell to you. They need your buy in to go along with this idea. And that's how much of our lives actually work these days. Right. But but when you're invested, as, as Stacy was saying earlier, when you're involved in the creation of the thing, you don't need buy in. You're in. You're all in because you you partook in the process of doing it. And you might not have gotten everything you wanted, but you were heard and you're willing to live with the compromises made in the process of making that particular brand of sausage. Pete. I like that, Jerry. Um, Uh, I, I wanted to, uh, I, Sam, I really liked your your earnestness and your plea for, hey, let's just start doing this. And I'm, I'm also inspired by you saying, maybe, maybe it, yeah, I'm inspired. Um, maybe it shouldn't be, but uh, uh, 
by by saying that you could set up a polis uh, instance. Um, I've been setting up uh, discourse instances kind of similarly um, and, and other things too, wikis and stuff. Um, let's talk. Uh, so the reason I'm doing this in the group is because I could send an email to Sam and say, hey, Sam, we should get back together and talk about building a community. Um, I want to do it when, with all of you because um, maybe some of you will be, be uh, interested to have a call with me and Sam. Um, I've got a fair amount of experience in bootstrapping communities, especially ones mediated with technology stuff like, uh, like Polis or Discourse um, or Mattermost or Wikis. Um, I think one of the things, Sam, you, you did an interesting thing. You said, hey, come join me, let's do this. Um, I would expect out of the group of folks here for maybe one person to join you full time um, and then another dozen or so, a dozen, dozen and a half to, to join you part time and be a cheerleader and, and want to be kind of involved in audit, but maybe not be super involved. Um, so I think what that means is um, maybe, actually maybe another another data point the dawn of everything book club i think two years ago was really successful um we got together and i think there were about a, a 10 of us um not all at the same time but we we cycled through 10 or 12 people um two or three four of whom were at most of the calls and, and we had most of the discussion um so Anyway, I, there's there's uh, a, a, a kind of a group size that you can get out of this population, um, which may be enough uh, for you to do some kind of theoretical philosophical work. Probably what you want is something bigger. Um, and so that is going to mean some kind of outreach, um, some way of, of saying, hey, um, and maybe it's the people here you ask and the people on the OGM list, uh, hey, um, here's this community I'm setting up. Um, I need, I really need you. <laughs> I'm trying to save the world here, folks. I really need you to ask 10 of your friends, you know, hey, this thing is going on. Um, you know, I can't participate because I'm too busy, but um, Sam is a great guy. They're doing great work. Um, you know, come join him. So I don't know if that's the only outreach or the even the outreach that you would look for, but another big component of this uh, working group that you're thinking of, of making is how big does it need to be to get done the stuff that it needs to do and how are you going to get to that size, right? So I've got a couple uh, communities in Bootstrap right now. Um, so I, I, I feel for you, um, but it's also, I know it's important. So thanks. The hand raising is going crazy. Um, Hank yeah. is waving his hand. Do you have to go? Yeah, I no, no. Okay. I wanted to raise my hand, uh, but the uh, it's not working. Yeah, I'm definitely excited about being in a, a group conversation about uh, uh, having an influence on millions of people. Uh, I know how difficult it is to have an influence on uh, a dozen people or even uh, half a dozen people. But the real question that that excites me about all the things that have been going on in this conversation and what Sam has been saying and what Pete is just saying is actually uh, sitting down or standing up with a group of people and saying, well, let's, let's just, let's just uh, talk about it. Let's talk seriously about it and let's not stop until we have a group of ideas where in some way or another we can prototype them. So if uh, you do set up a group like this, uh, please count me in. Thank you, Hank. Uh, Dave. And I, you touched on some of the stuff I was thinking about, Jerry, but I was, I was going back to Pete's example of the evolution of the RFCs and stuff. And, and actually, Pete, we gotta like write it down or something like that, right? Because I, I one of these, there's, I feel like there's a, uh, in, in that particular system, there is some control, right? And in Jerry's example of the ISO standards is right. I mean, there was a competing standard when the internet emerged that had been worked on by big governments and the US government had adopted it, in fact, right? But it never won, the internet won. And so there was something to the running code compart piece of things. So Cisco might be being checked by this, the running code component, right? If whatever they're suggesting is not sufficiently good, I think, right? Um, although we had said, you know, there's there's been, I'd say there's a bunch of assumptions we make in this conversation that I think we should question. 
And one of them, you know, Jerry, you used like the definition of what we're talking about. You said we want to maximize something and minimize something. I think the maximize minimizing structure is probably something we should question. Um, I, I, you know, and one was, Pete, you said that um, uh, a lot of bad ideas don't get adopted. I think, well, we don't actually know there were bad ideas, but they didn't get adopted, right? And there may well have been bad ideas that did get adopted and we're dealing with them today, right? I mean, so, so the bad and good might not be the right structure, right? Um, so, and, and I think, you know, Sam, one of the things I think you feel you're searching for is, is, is equanimity. You're looking for, you're looking for the, uh, where it stops. And these systems never stop. They always evolve. So, right, everything happens in the internet. Something else attacks it, right? And which I, so I think the biological thinking is probably better for a lot of this stuff. I mean, if we were to think of, again, government as a web, as an organic web of interacting forces, you're probably better off than you are thinking of it as a rule book. Right. Which is also why I was wondering about the model of the birds. Right. If there's rules that we're seeing or the rules approximate what we're seeing. But what is it we're seeing kind of is, is the level we're reaching for here. Um, so anyway, I kind of think that there's probably a few assumptions that are pretty deep in our current models that we need to challenge. And the efficiency one, um, you know, kind of maybe the logic one, but also the mechanic, any kind of mechanical thing. I think we should look at really hard and see if there's figure out a different way of looking at it. Dave, I, um, I think I share some of your worry about maximize, minimize. Certainly, I think that profit maximization is one of the large problems in our world right this minute. But I th think I mean what I said earlier in the sense of like the behaviors we're, we're observing, bird flocking and all that, we're following gradients. Uh, when you put a bacterium in a dish and you put some nutrient in a corner, it's basically finding its way toward the nutrient because it's maximizing the benefit it gets from every next molecule of, of whatever solution it happens to be sitting in. Uh, when birds are interacting with each other, uh, if you've ever driven in Argentina, uh, it's just like being in a flock of birds. The, the cars can go any place, the lines on the road are meaningless. Uh, and as long as you behave in a, in a, in a way that, that resonates with how everybody else is behaving, nobody will be, will be troubled. You turn too sharply, five cars will honk at you. Because but I, you, I'd say it's still satisfying, not max. You know, it's. it's I don't it's, know that. Well, so maximizing maybe means pegging the meter, which is not what we mean. Um, satisfying doesn't feel like enough, but that's a whole. There's a bunch of different conversations we. Or maybe the put tendency here. towards or something. Yeah. Yeah, in the chat also. Uh, what do we mean by transactions? Uh, you know, are these transactional or not? Uh, and and these questions go to a whole series of other uh, other philosophical things that we don't need to address right now, but. Uh, Back to Pete. Um, thanks for y'all's forbearance with uh, old internet war stories. I think the IETF experience is actually a really interesting one. And um, and thanks for kind of thinking through it, Dave. And you and I should get together and with Kalia or something and actually tell old, old, old war stories more. The um, the it's, it's easy to say a rough consensus and running code and not really think about it, but um, uh, and and I, I've gotten into the habit, I think many people do now, rough consensus and running code. Oh, that sounds like a cool slogan. Uh, the, the running code part was actually critical. Um, so you could propose anything you wanted to, but if you didn't have code running already, um, John Postel would bounce it. He's like, okay, go, go away. This is a great idea. <laughs> this is a lousy idea. I don't understand it. He doesn't care. Um, show me the code, show me it working. The other, the other rule uh, was that it had to have two independent, um, uh, two independent implementations. So you can say, look, I've got this working in my lab, but it doesn't actually talk to anybody, but I think I'm sure it'll work when somebody else talks to me. You had to go find some independent person and get them to implement your idea. And then the two ideas could talk together and, and run together. And that was the proof point when you could actually get your RFC published. So that that two thing, at least two thing thing, was also critically important. And it's a, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, the the uh, the way the internet developed was um, there was a lot of either grant money um, from the government or academic, you know, uh, academic money, uh, people paying professors and grad students to work on stuff. Um, so I don't know how you get that condition, 
But what that meant was that you could have multiple independent parties working on the same problem and coming up with a problem that worked together, right? Um, and then that was the thing that got proposed to everybody else. Hey, we have a thing working together. Um, and I think that's, we, we don't do that. We don't have that, you know, we don't have that kind of like, uh, let's, instead of me coming up with an idea and saying, I think this will work, let's pick somebody totally random, uh, not totally random, but pick somebody else. And when they can say that it works for me too, and, and these things cooperate, um, that's when you go to the next step and you say, I think we've got a, a, an ecosystem that works. Um, another, another critical thing in here was uh, something, I, I forget the term exactly, but they were bake-offs basically. Um, you know, once a year or something like that, you get everybody together uh, in, a, in a conference room in a hotel in, in San Jose. Um, everybody's running uh, their, their own version of IMAP, right? A particular protocol or whatever. Um, so uh, it was nice when you had two implementations independently that would run together. But what you really needed to do was to have your implementation run with 30 other implementations for people that did all kinds of crazy stuff, right? And they had backgrounds and, and, and uh, contexts that weren't part of what your thing was. And so inevitably, you, everybody wrote their thing to the spec and it was all perfect. But then when you got into a, a physical room with other people and your, your boxes were talking to each other, things would fall apart. And, you know, and I guess there's another weird thing. Uh, engineers love when things fall apart because that means they get to figure out what's going on and fix it. You also have to make sure that you've got uh, protection from management where it's like, oh, we can't say that things fell apart. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to embarrass ourselves. So you have to get through all of that. But I, I think we don't, I, I feel like it's a lesson that we, you know, came to in the 90s and we've kind of forgotten about it, how to do collaborative development of ideas rather than just, I've got an idea and I can get it bigger. Um, so, um, but, and, and by the way, I, th I thought experiment Dave went through really quickly is uh, if Cisco was trying to be extractive and, and didn't have running code, the, 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 the clincher is that Cisco actually could have running code for whatever idea they wanted um, because they had uh, uh, dollars to spend on engineers to develop code, right? So, um, so they could actually, uh, not that they did this necessarily, but they could decide um, to take somebody else's idea, um, develop it further, patent parts of it. Um, and then there was a deal where you, you could have a patent, but you had to say that I, I won't ever uh, enforce this against you know the the people using it for the internet. Um, they could warp the thing by just having a lot of um, a, a lot of money to spend on stuff. So um, you know now I I also I've been spending time in the background uh, trying to look stuff on on Internet Archive. Thank God Internet Archive is currently working. Um, another component, uh, separate from everything I just said, another component is the world is what we'll call griefers. There are people who just want to break things. Um, and that happened to the Internet Archive like four times this month. Um, the Internet Archive is more or less uh, like, it's kind of like a brick and mortar library with some plate glass windows and just books inside. People have been like coming over and driving trucks through the plate glass windows, throwing firebombs into it and stuff like that. Basically because it was fun and because they wanted to get some publicity. Um, so um, people will, take and destroy good things in the world just just because they can and that's another thing that as you get bigger in this stuff you get the people who are actively trying to use force against you and then you get the people who are using force against you without even really meaning to sometimes they're teenagers having you know they don't know what they're doing or something like that so as we do all of our coordination and governance and stuff like that um, you get people who aren't even motivated to hurt you, who are hurting you. Um, and then that's another thing to watch out for. Enjoy monkeys. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Good punctuation there. Gil. Yeah, let me be very brief because I really want to hear from Kevin Jones. Um, uh, Pete, terrific rant. I love it. Um, um, one of Neil Tice's four principles of complex adaptive systems is that a low level of randomness is essential. And so people driving trucks to your plate glass window is a version of that, or like ants deviating from the ant trail. 
you know, if all the ants stay in line, the colony dies because, you know, you run out of food and nobody's finding the next source of food. So you need the variation and it stresses the system. I love design competitions. Um, you've talked about some, and I think you know, the main point I'm getting from what you're saying is that the evolution of the internet is a really important part of this conversation because there we have a proof case of a very large, very significant, very successful, very influential system that evolved in a really different way then we're used to assuming things have to evolve. And Jerry, to your point about, uh, we're talking about philosophical things that we don't need to address right now. Maybe we do. So I'll leave it there. I, I, one of the polarities I've tried to manage in OGM calls is this thing between pragmatic and, and conceptual and so on and so forth. And every now and then we do need to dip into those things. In particular, we need to explore in what ways we agree and what ways we disagree about some of the terms that we're, that we're bouncing around here, for sure. Mr. Jones. Just really quickly on the point of coordination, I think the example with IETF is actually how you get to coordination in my experience. You start with a discovery of what's around, and then you do one-off cooperations, and then coordination arises and it's an emergent property. I've seen lots of people aim for coordination and almost never get there because they're starting with coordination. It, you know, it goes, Ronald Coase's transaction theory is how I, I've always followed this, which is discovery, one-off coordinations, and then multiple coordinations around that, around which some signals can be automated. And so I think I, I've seen aiming at coordination fail almost every time that that's the goal, as opposed to uh, creating the situation for coordination to emerge from discovery, followed by one-off uh, cooperations. And that's just, uh, that's how markets have formed. I mean, you know, uh, when they had to standardize the train tracks uh, between when, you know, the Northeastern hit the Midwestern and they had to agree on the size of the, uh, the rails because they, nobody could really ship things and they had to take everything off, bring a train that used the other uh, uh, gauge and they had to standardize on gauges and coordination is an, is a, is a phase that evolves once things are actually moving. So I, I think aiming at coordination is, is, is a, is a, is a one of these wonderful ideas where people always fail. Riding the rails before the railroads helped invent time zones was also a bit of an, an adventure. Yeah. Sam. Um, I've got to jump off in two minutes, but I just wanted to say, just to follow up on Pete's thing that I, I brought my um, my um, calendar in there. And one of the things I, I would appreciate if, is if anybody would like sort of jump on with me or a group of people, however, to um, basically try and shoot down this thing that I'm trying to build, see if you can find any holes in it or things that need to change or improve or whatever. That would be something I would really appreciate as well. Um, and, um, and I, 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 Peter, I think you have a better idea about community. You've asked some questions that I, I couldn't answer about how to do this, like with the polis for governance, et cetera. So I, I, I'm really interested to get back together with you, Pete, and kind of explore what you were talking about just a minute ago, because it, um, I didn't feel prepared to answer it. And, um, but I feel like there's some real value there. So I'm going to do that, but, um, it would be great to, um, to, to get uh, on a call with the, a bunch of y'all and um, just to to really do some real hardcore um, uh, red teaming and yellow teaming. So anyway, I got to run, uh, babysitter's leaving, kid is, I uh, got to bring the kid up. I have another call right away. So, but thanks again. I appreciate all the the um, conflict and uh, <laughs> yeah. Very, very briefly, Sam, if you want yeah. to uh, put on the OGM list, uh, pick a time when you want to do that call and in your Zoom and whatever, but just pick it by fiat, put it on the okay. OGM list and see who else wants to show up and help you. Okay, uh, that's good. I will do that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. We are also at time for our normally scheduled call. Um, would anybody like to put a bow on this conversation? or add in a closing comment that we can ponder. Uh, Quaker meeting often ends with uh, advices and inquiries. No, it was called something else, I don't remember, uh, which were lovely. So often they were just things that you were meant to ponder. Then maybe that's the thing we'll ponder.
thank you for this. I, I really appreciate this conversation. It's uh, provoked a whole lot of things in my both my brains. So very happy for that. Uh, continue on this topic next week. Yes, no. Are we tired of it? Have we worn this out? Are we good? How do you feel? Activity. Thumbs up. Good. Stacy. Up, down. Good, good. Okay, so the gladiator vote is is uh, the patient. Uh, the, the the warriors will live. Um, cool. Then uh, see you all next week. The week after that, I will actually be on an airplane during the call, and that's our check-in call for November. So I'm looking for someone who would like to be the host uh, in two weeks for the check-in round. Uh, ping me if you'd like to do that. I will ask on the list as well if nobody shows up. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.